So our last lecture introduced the basic idea of black holes as a concept. But to really understand black holes, you have to understand relativity. So we're going to start our discussion of relativity with what we call the Galilean relativity or relative motion. And this is something that you, you, you already know whether you realize it or not. And that is motion or velocity is distance over time, miles per hour, feet per second, meters per second, something like that. And so you go a certain distance in a certain amount of time. The distance divided by time is the speed that you're going. Okay. And so relative motion. So imagine this. You're on a moving sidewalk at an airport or something in a, little, a long concourse. The sidewalk's moving at uh, two feet per second. And you're walking on it and you're walking on the sidewalk at about two feet per second. So that means your total speed is four feet per second. So you actually get to the end of, of, of the concourse quicker by walking the sidewalk than just, you know, standing on it. Um, likewise, if you're in a car, you're driving down a highway, and you're driving at 60 miles an hour, and you, you look uh, to, to your left, and a car is passing you going 10 miles per hour faster, so it's 10 miles per hour relative to you. How fast is it moving? Well, you're going 50 miles an hour. It's going to pass you 10 miles per hour relative to you, so it's going at 60 miles an hour. So this is relative motion in the form of Galileo's relative motion. Well, Albert Einstein comes along and he realizes that light has an interesting property. The speed of light turns out to be uh, something that we get from Maxwell's equations. And so the Maxwell's equations, uh, uh, when you put them together and do a little bit of algebra and calculus, you come up with a wave equation. The speed of that wave is 1 divided by the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. So that's the permeability and permittivity of free space. Those are constants. So Einstein got to thinking about this and said, well, that would suggest that the speed of light is constant. And he went one step further and said, those constants don't really matter if you're moving or not. So he then said, you would always measure the speed of light to be the same no matter what you're doing. And that turned out to be a little bit problematic because, again, if you imagine that, that you're in a train and a train car, it's moving along at a certain speed and you have a ball rolling in the train car and, and so how, and you have someone standing out here watching, so if the train car is moving at two meters per second and the ball is going at one meters per second, this person would measure three meters per second for the ball because it's the sum of the two. But Einstein said that if you are got a spacecraft, it's moving at like one half the speed of light and you have a beam of light going across. This beam of light goes the speed of light. So if you're in the spacecraft, you see the beam of light go by at the speed of light. But if you're outside here, you still see the beam of light going the speed of light. And so the basic rules that we had before for Galilean relativity don't seem to apply. You know, likewise, if you've got two cars driving towards each other, so you've got two cars and they're driving towards each other, then if this car is going at 50 miles per hour and that one's also going at 50 miles per hour, then when they hit, they hit at 100 miles per hour. That's why head-on collisions are so horrible. But Einstein said, no, if you've got a spacecraft going this way and it's going at uh, 0.75 the speed of light and light's going this way the speed of light, that you see it hitting the spacecraft at the speed of light. So you always measure the same thing. And so that breaks the basic sort of things from how relative motion works. So light gives you this constant value. 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, or 300,000 kilometers per second, or 186,000 miles per second. And so the speed of light turns out to be constant, uh, no matter what your motion is. Well, this is the basics behind what we call special relativity. 
So the consequence of that, what does that mean? Again, if, again, put this back into, you know, terms, you know, like in your textbook. You've got a ball moving 30 meters per second. You've got a, 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 a fielder uh, running at 10 meters per second. So imagine a softball game here. And so the ball hits the glove at 40 meters per second. Okay. But light moving at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second hits the spacecraft at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, even though the spacecraft is moving at one-third the speed of light. And so uh, it's the same thing here. This is moving a certain speed. This is going one third the speed. Uh, but still, up here, you add the, the result. Here, you don't. Okay. So the speed of light is always going to be a constant value. Okay. Now, that was a, a revolutionary sort of statement that he made. And it's interesting that shortly prior to his making that statement, that a couple of physicists were... Uh, working in the United States to measure how fast Earth moves relative to light. And so the idea was Earth was moving through something called the luminiferous ether, and light was traveling through it at a certain speed. And so the idea would be that that light would be traveling from a light source. It would hit a beam splitter, so half of it would go one way, half go the other way, come back, and then when they come together, they make a pattern here. And so, um, now actually, this is an interesting sort of experiment, very similar to one we actually do in our majors physics class, in which we have a beam of light, um, hits a beam splitter, one half goes to a detector, the other half goes across the room into a detector, and by measuring how they, they come back together, we can find, we can find the speed of light uh, uh, going across the room and back. And so... Um, what their idea was, they'd put this big detector on a giant uh, 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 granite slab that was floating on a pool of mercury, and then rotate it slightly. As it rotated, if Earth was moving through space, then one of these path lengths would be a different length than the other path length. You know, so, so in other words, if Earth is moving this way, then this beam of light would actually take a different, different length, different distance than that one. And so, so as you rotate it, it would change this one to being different. And so that would cause this pattern to shift. And so by doing that, you could measure the, the uh, motion of Earth through the ether and how the speed of light appeared to change based on the motion of the Earth. Well, their experiment showed no change. And so they tried their experiment several times, tried a different time of the year, tried it at a different time of day, you know, wondering if maybe the motion of the earth, you know, combined with everything else was doing it. No, they didn't do it. So they came, the, the conclusion is that light does, the, 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 the light does not travel through this ether and earth's not traveling relative to the ether. And, and, um, and, uh, and this is exactly what you expect if, in fact, Einstein's right. So Einstein worked, worked on the mathematics of this, and it turned out that his theory turned out to match almost exactly an experiment that was going on uh, just a sh few years earlier. And, and uh, uh, so he came up with the explanation to why this works this way. So that means the speed of light is a constant value.